Hey everyone, welcome back to Science. This is Mr. Bond here. I um, want to just remind you before we go ahead and get started that it may be helpful for you to grab a piece of paper and a pencil to jot down some of your thinking as we go throughout uh, this new lesson. We're going to be starting a brand new chapter for our evolutionary history. Um, and so we're going to start with a little review of what we learned in chapter two and go over what is our goal for this unit as scientists. And if you remember, we are acting as paleontologists um, while we are doing some investigation around evolutionary history, and in particular, this mystery fossil right here. So just to kind of review what we learned in chapter one, we started to talk a lot about similarities that we saw between the body structures of different species. And we said that species are going to inherit, which means those body structures are passed down from ancestor populations, meaning populations of um, a specific species that lived before uh, the current one. We also learned that body structures that are shared between two species shows that at some point those species shared a common ancestor. So if you remember, we did a little bit of work around these two things in our last unit. So I wanted to start by reviewing those, and now we're gonna get into really thinking about what we learned at the end of our last unit that didn't necessarily have to do with body structures, but actually had to do with um, the way that one of the species reproduces. And in our mystery fossil, this picture you can see is the full picture of um, the entire fossil, not just kind of the torso, but there was some new information that we got a couple lessons ago that the mystery fossil was pregnant when it died. Um, so what that really told us was if we're looking at whales, wolves, and crocodiles and trying to figure out which one of those is most closely related to this fossil, that we were able to, in our last lesson, really start to narrow down our claims. We had originally started by thinking, all right, this mystery fossil might be related to a whale, it might be related to a wolf. Um, but then what we did was we started to figure out that actually, because that new evidence we had that said that the mystery fossil was pregnant, meaning that it gave birth to a live um, animal, it couldn't be related or that it was probably less likely related to the crocodile because crocodiles don't give live birth. Um, in fact, crocodiles uh, are hatched from eggs. So we're going to move into a deeper question um, in this second chapter. We're going to start to really dive into how did all of these different species come about on Earth and look so different? If they're all related, how did they end up becoming so different? And we're really going to focus around those three species. We don't have time to look at every single species on the planet, but we're going to start to really dive into why are wolves, crocodiles, and whales so different from their common ancestors. So last second as a reminder, if you need to grab a uh, pencil and a piece of paper, we're gonna start our warm up now, which is gonna be something that you may want to uh, go ahead and write down as you go through. So this image is an image we've looked at before. And for your warm up, what I'm gonna, gonna want you to do is to look closely um, at the diagram right here. And it's showing you, it's got color coded some of those shared structures, the radius, the ulna, and the distal bones. So as you think about these three things, in the past we thought about some of the similarities between them. Now what I want you to do is I want you to carefully observe and look for differences. Differences between each of these individual structures. So even though they do have some shared structures, what we're gonna start to look at today is that these shared structures can be slightly different and have some different functions based on a few different factors, which we're going to really dig into today. So go ahead and take a moment to pause the video. Again, if you haven't grabbed a pencil and a piece of paper, do that now. And you want to go ahead and answer this question. So using careful observation of the cat and human limbs, what are at least two differences um, that you notice between these two front limbs. Go ahead and pause right now. Okay, 
Hopefully you got a chance to pause. If you didn't, go ahead and pause and go back and make sure you have answered this question. We're gonna move on to starting to think about some of the differences between three species in particular. And if you remember, I think it was four lessons ago, we started to practice sorting animals and we started to think about what were some of the differences between them um, and some of the ways that we could sort those different animals. So three that we're gonna zoom in on today is the dire wolf, fruit bat, and the titanolophus, which is this uh, creature that looks similar to a camel, I think. So, what I would like you to do is we're going to be comparing these. And so one thing that's really helpful when you're comparing is um, creating a T chart for yourself. So all of this that is outlined in blue, you may want to write down on a piece of paper. It's going to help you. If you do need to pause the video now to take a second to copy this down, that would be great. You're going to have uh, two horizontal lines and three vertical lines so that you can have six total boxes and we're going to talk about what's going to go here in a little bit. So go ahead and pause and get this jotted down and when you're done uh, make sure you have the three species the wolf, the bat, and the titanolophus because we're going to now start to look at the observations of each of these limbs just like we did in our warm-up for the cat and the human limb. But now we're gonna to start to look at these three different species. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slowly click through each of the next few slides, which are going to have the specific species and they're going to have a really, really large, it blew it up, so hopefully it will be easy to see some of those details and be specific in our observations. Um, each of the front limbs that you can compare and jot down some detailed observations on. So this is our wolf. Again, feel free to pause the video right now and fill in that first box for the wolf. This is your first box that you're filling in for the observations of the limbs. Then you're gonna make some observations on the fruit bat, and then you're gonna make some observations on the titanolophus. So I'm gonna click through those slides slowly Feel free to pause, take your time, fill in your T-chart, and make sure you have made as many observations as you think are important. Remember, more observations are better, but also making sure that you are being as detailed as possible in the language you're using to describe what you see. Okay, so hopefully at this point, you had a chance to make some observations of uh, the different parts of those front limbs and uh, recorded some detailed things about the shapes you saw uh, or maybe the number of fingers you saw on each of those limbs. Uh, we're gonna move on now to go ahead and read a little bit about those individual species. If you didn't get time to fill in these three boxes up top, these three boxes that have check marks in it are the ones that at this point you should have filled in. So you can see mine just have a check mark. Yours should have writing in here with your observations. If you're not done with that part, go ahead and go back, rewind the video, and make sure you are making observations of those three different species. The next thing that we're going to look at is we're going to start to think about in this next row. Where does each of these uh, individual species live and how do they survive? Because we're going to start to think about, is there a reason that the limbs may be shaped in the way that they are? And thinking about where the animals live and what they need to do to survive are going to help us. So if you didn't get a chance, jot this in right here. We didn't have that filled in in our original um, uh, T-chart. And then we're gonna be finishing up by filling in the three boxes down here. Same thing as before, I'm gonna click through some slides 
but now you're going to notice that each of these slides actually has a little bit of information. So instead of making observational evidence, you're going to be reading through the information and looking for some um, important information that's going to tell you what? Well, if you go back to the last slide, remember we want to really be looking for where do they live and how do they survive. So let's go ahead, let's do the first one together so I can give you an idea of what you want to be looking for. Okay, so for the dire wolf, it says the dire wolf is an ancient species that went extinct approximately 10,000 years ago. It lived on land. So that might be a key thing that I would want to jot down, lived on land. That's something that's telling me about how it lived. Paleontologists use many kinds of evidence, including, including the size and shape of its bones, to determine that it was a predator that needed to run and attack large organisms for food. So there's a couple pretty unique things in there about the dire wolf. One is that it's a predator, meaning that it has to kill other animals. It also says that it attacks large organisms for food and that it does that by running. So if we're starting to look at the limbs, thinking about movement in the next few slides and how these animals move, as well as how they live is going to be super important. So I'm going to go ahead and click through the next two slides, the fruit bat and the titanolophus, and you can pause the video to go ahead and read through each of those and make sure you are jotting down your notes in that last section on your T-chart. Okay, so hopefully at this point, you have gotten filled in all six of these uh, places where you could have taken some notes. If you didn't, I'm gonna really encourage you to go back in the video and make sure you've recorded your observations. So that's what you saw. And then what we read was uh, how those individual animals survive. So if you didn't get a chance to do that, go ahead and this video I'm gonna wrap up but go back and start to look at which ones did you maybe miss. You can scroll through, just pause on the one that you maybe didn't get a chance to fill in and finish that up. We'll continue here in a second with the second video for the second half of this lesson. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and start the second half of this unit. Hopefully again, you had a chance to fill in this entire T-chart with some of your notes you took um, on these previous few slides that had some information about the three different animals. Um, and then also there were some uh, observations that you should have made based on the shared structures they had of their front limbs. So now that we've got that done, we wanna start to think a little bit more deeply um, about how might these specific structures support the animal in its environment. So here are some things that I jotted down when I was going through and making some of my observations. So if you see something in here maybe that you did not have or that you think is important, go ahead and take a second to add that to yours. Um, you can also do the same for where they lived and how they survived. Mine is not necessarily perfect. There might be some information in there that you don't think is super helpful, um, but there might also be some information that you realize you missed that you do want to get taken down for your notes. So we'll just click through these and feel free to pause the video and add any notes for your specific species that you see in uh, these boxes here. Here's the one for the fruit bat. And then lastly, here's the one for our Titanolophus. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start to figure out, okay, what are some of the things for each of these organisms that would have supported it in its environment? So really what we're going to be thinking about is how might the environment influence each species structure? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the thinking that I want you to be doing 
um, and I'm gonna kind of model that thinking for you with the wolf, then your job will be to start to think about the structures of the fruit bat and the titanolophus and think about how would their structure, remember that's the way that front limb is made up, how is that going to um, be influenced by where they live and what they need to survive? So let me uh, kind of give you an example of what the thinking that you're gonna wanna be doing uh, might sound like in your head. So when we look at the wolf here, what we're gonna notice is that, whoops, is that it has some long uh, finger-like bones and some are bent flat and others are a part of the leg. It's got some claws and I noticed that it has some very bendy fingers. So a couple things that I started to think about were that, well, predator, as a predator, it's gonna need something to be able to capture its prey. So that's where its claws probably come in. If it was something that ate grass, like a cow, um, or maybe in a second here when we start to look more into the titanolophus, we might see that the ends of their fingers um, are things that don't have claws on them. But the wolf makes sense to me that as a predator, it would have those claws. Those two things might be related. Uh, other things that I noticed is that the wolf needed to run. It needed to hunt and kill large organisms. So one of the things that I noticed was that it also has uh, some bent flat parts and other parts of its legs that are not very bent. So that one's a little bit tricky to think about, but when I was thinking about it, I kind of thought about it as a spring and some things that were uh, squishy and could move as it's running to kind of cushion its running ability, but then it also needed uh, bones that were long and hard to be able to provide structure to push off of the ground. So what I would love for you to do now is take a look at the fruit bat and take a look at the titanolophus. What I did was I highlighted some things that may uh, be pieces of the environment that influence that species structure. So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause. You may want to even jot this down and answer this question. What are some of the pieces of the environment that could have influenced the specific structures of those species limbs? So we did the wolf together. You may want to write down your answer that we went over for that. But at this point in the video, go ahead and pause and think about the fruit bat and think about the titanolophus answering this question right here. All right, hopefully you paused the video and thought through those two organisms. If you didn't, now is a good time to pause and go ahead and rewind this video just a little bit. The next section we're gonna be working on has uh, some pieces that you're going to be looking at a simulation. So if you are someone who at home has access to the simulation in uh, Amplify, what I want to really encourage you to do is make sure that you are opening up that simulation and completing this yourself. There's going to be a few different options. I'm going to give you an option for if you do have access to the simulation and you want to walk through that. I'm going to give you some directions for if you don't have the simulation at home, but you want to work through the thinking independently. And then the last kind of option that you have is I'm going to walk through in the simulation some of the thinking that you might do independently. So I wanna really encourage you if you do have that simulation to go ahead and open it up now. What you're gonna do is access that simulation by opening it up in Amplify. And today we're gonna to be clicking on this mammals icon. So if you do have access to the simulation, what I would encourage you to do is go ahead and go into Amplify right now, open that up. I'll walk you through how to do that. And then what you can do is work through these next two slides that are blue. So each of them are labeled as access to the simulation. And on the first slide, you're gonna see this is your goal. This is what you're working on in the simulation. And then these are some tips to help you get started once you get in there. Finally, once you've got the two species opened up that you are going to be examining, 
there are three questions that you want to answer and work through. So let's go ahead, for those of you that do have the simulation at home, I'll show you how to make sure you are opening that up correctly. So whatever method you usually use to log into Amplify is gonna be what you are opening up with. I log on here. I'm gonna go ahead and start to get logged on. Okay, hopefully my internet will let me get logged on here. There we go. And then when you get into Amplify, you wanna make sure, remember we're starting in a new chapter. Mine automatically logs me into that old lesson that we were working on, lesson 1.4. So go ahead and make sure that you are opening up chapter two, and we are working in 2.1. Within 2.1, we're working on this last activity, activity four. And so you wanna click on activity four and then go ahead and the link will open you up and load that new simulation. So like I said, if you're working at home, remember you're gonna be working on those two blue slides. You wanna click right here where it says mammals. And then you're gonna notice that you've got all of your mammals over here. So. Um, I'm going to go back into my presentation. If you do have that simulation at home, now's your time. Pause the video and work through these next two slides. All right. If you don't have the simulation at home, but you'd like to work on this independently, um, these next two green slides are going to be the ones that you're going to want to be focusing on. So when you see the green background, this one, there's a lot of information, so there's not a ton of green, but these green, this green background is going to be what you want to work through. So when you get into the simulation, which you aren't going to need to do um, if you don't have access to it, there's two species that it's going to want us to compare, the Cachetias and the Smilodon or the saber-toothed tiger. I love that name because it has a very unique smile with those giant fangs up there at the front of its mouth. So you're going to be answering the same questions as we looked at before. So for you, you're going to want to pause the video here, preview those questions, and then go back to this slide right here so that you can start to compare some of the structures within these two organisms. What you're gonna notice is like we talked about at the beginning of our lesson, they're gonna have some shared structures and some of their shared structures are going to be really similar and some of them are going to be slightly different even though they share that structure. So in here, it's going to ask you to discuss some of those similarities and then also make sure that you have read about what was their environment like um, just like we practiced before, so you can start to think about how might their unique structure be related to the environment in which they live. So go ahead, if you are going to want to work through independently on these green two slides, pause the video, rewind it a little bit, and go ahead and start to answer these questions right here. All right. If you don't have access to the simulation and you're wanting to think through this together with me, um, we're gonna go ahead and do this on these next few red slides. So you're gonna be wanting to write down the same questions, the same answers. I'm gonna talk through them. So you're gonna wanna be making sure that you are listening really closely because uh, in the last section when we practiced together, I kind of showed you what my notes were. For this section, I'm not gonna do that. So what you wanna be doing is making sure you're listening to what exactly am I saying we are, which structure are we gonna be talking about? And then what are some of the differences that we're talking about with those shared structures? So let's go ahead and go into the simulation and we're going to pull up those two species. So, this map is showing us where we found all of those different mammals. 
Um, and the two mammals that we are going to be studying is the first one we're going to be studying is the Smilodon or the saber-toothed cat. Um, and then the other one, if you scroll through here, here it is, uh, the Kutcher Cetus, which is tricky to say, the Cuchicetus, the pronunciation is right here. Um, so here we've got our information about those two organisms. Uh, the saber-toothed tiger, it says, which is kind of no surprise, it says it was a predator with those giant teeth. Um, and they became extinct about 10,000 years ago. The Smilodon was a little bit shorter than a lion, but it weighed twice as much and had powerful legs. So now that should start to make me think, okay, I want to be listening closely because it's starting to talk about its legs and that is what we are going to be comparing one of those limbs to the limbs of the Cuchicetus. It also says that it lived in social groups like lions do today, but unlike the lion, the Smilodon had a very short tail and very long canine teeth, up to seven inches long. That is crazy. Those are some huge teeth. It also says that the Smilodon hunted large herbivores such as bison by sneaking up on the animals and ambushing them using its saber teeth to deliver a quick fatal stab. So we've got a little bit of background on the saber-toothed cat. Let's bounce over here and read about the Cuchicetus. It says the Cuchicetus was a small otter-like mammal that lived about 45 million years ago. Cuchicetus lived in tropical seas. Their small hind legs were probably not very helpful for swimming. So they used their large tails to propel them through water. These animals had a layer of fat under their skin called blubber, just as whales have today. The blubber covered the entire areas of their body and helped keep them warm. So that's a little bit of background information for us to think about. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, we can click on the appearance thing here. It's just gonna show us what those might have looked like in real life. Um, the saber-toothed tiger is pretty cool looking if you ask me, uh, the Cuchicetus is not quite as cute as uh, an otter in my personal opinion. It's kind of got a funny looking head, but you might think differently. Uh, so the main piece that we want to look into next is we want to look into one feature that they have that is similar, one structure I should say that they have that's similar, and start to think about what are some of the differences in those features. So I'm gonna just zoom in here a little bit so that we can start to take a look and think about what are some of the differences that we're noticing. So I'm starting to notice a few things that are different, even though they share the structure. Just as a reminder, before I go into modeling how I'm thinking about these different structures, you're going to want to make sure that you are answering for yourself these questions. So I'm going to start by highlighting the structure and talking about what are some of the differences I see. You may want to even pause the video right now and realize like, hey, I don't need the support. I'm going to go ahead and look and compare between these two things independently, and that is totally fine. So the first thing that I am going to uh, zoom in on here is I'm going to start to look at uh, actually two structures. I'm going to look at the radius and the ulna. And those are kind of those lower bones in their limbs. And when I read about the saber-toothed tiger, it said that they needed to be able to uh, ambush their prey and attack them, which is telling me that they have got to be pretty fast and they've got to be pretty strong in order to be able to attack their predators. And in fact, I'm also noticing that these bones are pretty large. And they, in the reading, it also stated that a, the Smilodon weighs about twice as much as a lion, which means that they have got a lot of weight to hold. So in my mind, I'm starting to think that maybe one of the reasons why these are long and quite a bit bigger than our Cuchicetus over here is because they need to be able to support that Smilodon and 
being a strong animal that can run fast and ambush its prey. And also they've got a lot of weight that they can support. Now, if I look over here at the Cuchicetus, I'm gonna notice that these bones are really quite a bit smaller. Um, even in comparison, the Cuchicetus, yes, it is smaller, but if we think about overall, those bones are quite a bit thinner than the bones of the Smilodon. And what I may be thinking is that that is because this animal, uh, like it said down here, lived in the sea. So they probably aren't walking around a lot. And it also said that these aren't necessarily the main things that they use to swim, but instead they use their tail, which I'm noticing is really long. So for me, I might jot down that the radius and the ulna of this Cuchicetus is quite a bit smaller than the Smilodon, and that that probably has to do with the fact that they're not attacking prey, they're not spending most of their time on land. So go ahead and if you didn't get a chance to fill in these three questions, you're gonna to wanna to rewind the video and take a second to compare the structures of those two individual species. Um, this is gonna wrap up our lesson, so make sure you're spending some time finishing up and practicing thinking about those differences because in the last uh, chapter, we narrowed down between a whale and uh, the wolf as what our mystery fossil is most similar to. But now what we want to start to think about is why are there actually those differences? So we're going to continue that thinking in our next lesson. So I'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now.